Trade 2.3 The Emergence of Trans Regional Networks of Communication and Exchange Time Period 2. Now, before we get started, I love talking about trade because trade is the backbone of the economics um, theme of SPICE. And that's really important for you as a student because, in my opinion, economics is the easiest theme that connects all the other themes. If you have done your job properly as a student and have read the book and taken your notes and, and reviewed properly, you should be able, when you talk about essays and multiple choice questions and just regular thinking about this course, to connect economics to every other theme, social, political, you know, in, uh, uh, culture, all the others will somehow connect to trade and economics. So today, we're going to, have to break down economics as it relates to time period two. Now, the first thing we need to talk about is the basic backbone of 2.3.1, which is that land and water routes became the basis for trans-regional trade, communication, and exchange networks in the Eastern Hemisphere. And later on, somewhat down the road, separate networks connected people and societies of the Americas. So we're going to concentrate our focus here on the Eastern Hemisphere, because that's where a lot of the good stuff is happening. And then later on, we'll talk about the Americas here slightly. Now, first thing you have to do is be able to define trans-regional. When you're reading that, that key concept, that word probably is the most difficult for you to wrap your head around. And in fact, a couple of years back, they asked an essay question on the AP exam about um, inter-regional and intra-regional. So if you don't have regional and trans-regional and all those kind of buzz terms understood, you need to write them down so you can start um, looking at them and, and memorizing them. It'll make your lives a whole lot easier. In this case, trans-regional is the most basic of the three. It just means across different regions. So for now, when we look at empires and growth and we look at trade and growth, um, they're going to go hand in hand. These empires are going to be starting to trade across different regions. Now, there's a lot of reasons why these uh, trade networks are forming the way they do. Um, climate and location is the most uh, rudimentary. Um, where are they located and where are they located probably has to do with good climate. You're not going to go on a route that's going to take you over mountains and through cold and all that kind of stuff, right? It's like when you take a trip. You're going to go through the most you know, beautiful, serene uh, locations. And so that's what some of these routes are going to be forming and taking place as far as where they're being created. Um, and then the typical trade goods, you got to look at that. Um, trade routes and roads and stuff pop up because there's a need for a certain good in a different region that they don't produce. It's very basic. We've already covered some of that earlier on with some of our early, early societies and breaking down the Neolithic Revolution, right? Um, so you should always keep an eye on that. Why are the goods being traded? Those goods being traded will lead us to the development of these routes. And then finally, the ethnicity of people involved. That's going to be important when we start talking about um, culture <clears throat> and things that are spreading beyond just regular old direct goods. Okay, so AP expects you to know um, the six following examples of these land and routes. The ones in bold are the called the big three of this time period. They're the heavy hitters, and we're going to break down each and every one of these um, in depth in the next couple of slides. The first one is the Eurasian Silk Road. Um, the next is the Trans-Saharan Caravan Route. The third is the Indian Ocean Sea Lanes. And then they also expect you to know at least one of the following three. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea Lanes, the American Trade Routes, and the Baltic, Constantinople, Central Asia, North to South Connection Routes. So those three um, are minor in this time period because the big three above it in bold really take the broad focus here um, for most of the students during the course. So, um, as part of the curriculum and the key concepts, you need to be able to know basic geography. Now, I'm sure the other t uh, instructors have mentioned this during some of their PowerPoints, but if not, I will, I will do that and I will reiterate that you have to know where these things are located. If you don't understand where basic things are located, you really need to take some time, step back, and look at the maps and the regions that AP has set aside for you that we have given you as well, and start memorizing those things. So. For the big three, the top left is the Silk Road, the network of the Silk Road. You can see where it began with the Roman Empire's edge, uh, and then it, where it ends or starts, however you want to look at it, glass half empty type of deal, with uh, Shang'an, the, the old capital of the Chinese Empire. Um, and then on the uh, far right there, there are the caravan, trans-Saharan caravan, trans, once again, across the Saharan 
So when you see trans-regional across multiple regions, trans-Saharan across the Sahara Desert. So there you go there. There's some routes for you. And then finally, the bottom left are the Indian Ocean sea lanes. Uh, this kind of goes a little bit beyond our time period a little bit, but I want to give you a basic breakdown as to what some of those routes were looking like. Um, you kind of get the gist here of uh, some of the basic routes. And then, of course, here are two of the three of the others. Um, the one on the left is the Mediterranean Sea Lanes, which is really important for after um, the, uh, the fall of the Roman Empire and kind of that, you know, um, major wars for religion in the East. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea Lanes are going to be really, really important after that. Uh, for our time period now, we may concern ourselves with, you know, Rome moving into the empire there um, above that little brown line and uh, all their territory that they're controlling trade for. And then, of course, on the Americas there on the far right, um, not a whole lot of connectedness going on there. Um, there is trade, but it is very loose, not very long distance, um, and that's one of the reasons why the Americas um, often get uh, kind of swept up to the to the backside here of our discussions for this time period because not a whole lot is going on. They're kind of isolated on their own little island. The Silk Road uh, is the probably the most important one early on that we will cover. Um, really important. It's not a really a road per se, which you probably have already figured out. It's more of a network of paths, and um, trade is the most basic reason why this route is being created and formed. But other stuff will come along with that, mainly religion and culture. Culture, once again, is a big umbrella. You're talking about things like language, customs, law, food. Uh, and then, of course, religion as a part of that as well. Uh, we're going to see some of those movements later on as we start to wrap up today's discussion. Um, this will empower and destroy nations, and we will look at two of those breakdowns early on, um, towards, or not early on, towards the end. Rome and China especially as the starting point, end point, per se, for this route. Um, both of those nations, those, those empires, will undergo a massive empowerment and ultimately a destruction um, due to, at some level, this uh, route, this trade network. And then, of course, political structure um, of territory, because, of course, people are vying for control over this route, and so that often leads to political innovation or political upheaval and shifting paths of, of access and control, fighting, right? There's fighting going on for these routes, and if you can secure these routes and keep them safe, then that's going to make you better, politically speaking, as a position versus people who have let this trail route go by the wayside. We know the major <clears throat> um, early on uh, goods that are traded, tea, uh, silk, hence the name of the route. That's the really the big one that get, got this whole thing started. Um, porcelain, all those are coming from China to the west. Um, they're very lucrative and they're sought after by the Romans and by others in the, in the mediary. Um, so that's going to be a reason why this network of uh, roads is put together. And then finally, monopolies. You have to look at uh, um, the importance of monopolies here. We'll start seeing monopolies later on when it comes to trade guilds and unions and stuff in the, in the Western world. Uh, you know, think of Europe at the time. Um, after the fall of the Roman Empire, but for now, um, the Chinese have monopolies on a lot of these goods that are being, um, you know, passed along this route. Um, guarded secrets of production in parentheses there, because they are actually very secretive about how silk is produced and how it's uh, controlled, how it's shipped. That way, they keep the money and the profits as high as they can get. <clears throat> Now, um, the Persians and the Byzantine Empire, Byzantine Empire in this case is the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, and Persia, of course, has another empire we've already studied this time period. They have long controlled uh, the profit here because of where they're located, right along the western um, border of the, of the Silk Road, the eastern Mediterranean, obviously. Um, they're going to control a lot of that uh, to, the, to the west of the western world, so they're going to have a lot of power. And then eventually that power will wane as the Mediterranean sea lanes become more and more profitable and controllable by people like Venice and Milan, the city-states of the uh, Italian world. Um, they're going to start bypassing these land routes in favor of more waterway routes and uh, sea routes. And we'll talk about some of the things that let them do that uh, in the next upcoming slides here. And eventually, a final little note here for the Silk Road, uh, all this discussion that we just talked about will eventually lead to really, really, really early, 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 early on uh, visions of imperialism going in, taking over areas in order to control them. 
the Trans-Saharan caravan lanes. Uh, Trans-Saharan across the Sahara Desert, of course. Caravans are the camels and labor animals that are used to do that. Um, this is a source of income for the African empires on the Gold Coast. Uh, Mali, Songhai, uh, Western Africa has a couple of these different empires that we'll look at next time period that um, they control these routes and they really control gold. They have a very large supply of gold that is mined from these uh, regions and um, under control of these uh, empires. <clears throat> so in order to keep that supply of gold down, they're trading it very sparsely with uh, salt, salt from the northern uh, sections near the Mediterranean. So that give and take across the Sahara Desert is uh, the formation of these, sea, of these uh, caravan lanes. Lots of wealth is generated, um, lots of different empires rise and fall with that generation of wealth and that control. Places like Timbuktu, which is one of the cities that you'll sometimes cover when we talk about major city development. Um, then of course later on down the road here, um, talking post 600, so just beyond our um, time period too, um, but we're going to mention it now. Uh, Islam will come into the region through uh, Egypt and the Arabian Peninsula, and then will start to work its way uh, counterclockwise through Africa. And uh, Islam is going to be, um, you know, introduced first through fighting, but that's not a, that's not really a workable system. So they get in through trade, Muslim traders, and then of course that will slowly settle into Africa um, until uh, most of Africa is Muslim, and it creates one of the largest Muslim empires in the world ever seen. And then once again, as a footnote here, really early, early, early visions of imperialism because eventually. Africa is seen as a spot of great wealth and resource that um, the Western world wants to get their hands on. Uh, stuff like slavery, then that gold, um, and other precious stones, things of that nature. The final one of the big three, the Indian Ocean sea lanes. Um, Mediterranean traders and mariners start to work their way into the Indian Ocean, but, but when they get there, they see that this area has already been uh, been utilized by, um, you know, India, obviously, China is a big one, and the eastern coast of Africa. Um, goods from China and Southeast Asia, uh, we know through records, are being traded to places like India and the African coastline. Um, along the way, places like India, lots of goods like precious metals, silver, copper, um, gold, they don't have much access to that as the other neighbors do. They have precious stones, however, like diamonds and such, um, and they have the goods uh, as well that they are growing that can be uh, utilized for trade here. We also know that Rome traded heavily with um, the Indians. We found uh, through records and archaeology lots of uh, different buried hordes of, of um, goods, including Indian coins and Roman coins. And so beyond precious metals, we know that things like cloth, ceramics, pottery, there's a couple more listed for you, spices is a big one, um, pearls, coral, you name it, uh, and that little line there, we found all of these as examples of early on traded goods through the Indian Ocean. And then of course, India really is the buffer between the eastern and the western portions of the sea lanes and the Silk Road, so we know that silk is traveling overland during that um, and also through these water uh, sea lanes. Um, goods like sugarcane, cotton, sesame, and rice, they're going to be grown or being started to grown, uh, grow in India, and they will also be exported as kind of a way to make ends meet here. Um, a big important idea for the Indian Ocean sea lanes is the spread of religion. Uh, between 600 and 300 BCE, you see a massive rise in the spreading of three different religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. Those are all going to spread to Southeast Asia, um, and that will be very important for us in many cases towards the end here as we build into the next couple of time periods. Um, and then, of course, spread of religion influences things like language, script with writing uh, being you know, unified, and, of course, the gods and goddesses themselves, the deities that are being uh, you know, um, worshipped here, those things will also be influenced by the spread. And we know that at the most basic level that this is happening because there are temples that we have found that date back to this time period that are not native to that area. So obviously we know religion is spreading. Um, and those merchants, like they did with Islam in Africa, um, as a comparison, they are also spreading religion more widely in the Indian Ocean sea lanes. So look for comparison and contrast whenever you can. Uh, there are a couple on this slide alone that could help you in some possible potential essays. So 3.2.2, um, Roman numeral 2, the new technologies facilitating long-distance communication and exchange. The first is obviously land route examples. 
So 3.2 dot Roman numeral 2a looks at new technologies permitting the use of domesticated pack animals for longer route transportation. Basic three examples, yokes, saddles, stirrups. Okay, um, there's a picture of each one of these, yoke for oxen and, and large animals, saddles for horses or camels to be ridden, and then of course stirrups, the little things you put your feet in um, that, that typically go uh, on the bottom of a saddle. Those things are being used uh, in all the places in the Eastern Hemisphere to ride domesticated animals like horses, oxen, and camels. In the Americas, we see a few minor examples of even llamas having saddles and such being used, but uh, not as much and extensive as uh, we saw in the East. And of course, the benefits of each one of these things are that it allows for easier travel and uh, quicker travel. You know, if I can ride more comfortably on a horse um, because of a saddle and a stirrup and not wear out my legs or my back, that can let me ride longer, you know, distance or longer in the day, and I can get further along my, my uh, trade route, uh, you know, activity. That's good. And if oxen can do a share of the heavy lifting and pull stuff, um, that saves me from having to pull it. And therefore, once again, I can go further distances quicker. Time is money, right, when it comes to trade. So you want to save time in order to make more money. The other example here for 3.2 Roman numeral 2 are these sea trade route examples. So A is the land. B talks about the sea. Innovations in maritime technologies. Um, well as advanced technology of monsoon winds stimulate exchanges along maritime routes from East Asia to East Africa. The two great examples here are the Lantine sail and the Dow ships. Now, here are two visuals here for you. They're kind of the same basic visual because the sail, obviously, is the use of the triangular sails here to catch wind uh, at a more efficient level. And then the ship is the method at which the actual ships themselves were built. Um, and we see these along the um, Indian Ocean, um, and they're going to be the main vessel for travel and trade here along the sea lanes. <clears throat> so the benefits here are you can go even longer distances with a ship in the same distance, if not shorter, time span um, than their land counterparts. It took a very long time to take a team of oxen and horses and camels across the Silk Road, for example. If I could go that exact same route with a bunch of ships, I can carry way more goods, probably be safer along the way because of less bandits and such, and uh, get there quicker because of the winds and being able to move faster. Plus, I don't have to feed a bunch of ships food to keep them alive. Now, I do have to do that with animals, so that's a big difference there. Uh, once again, time is money, and more goods moved even quicker is even more money. Uh, and then finally, 3.2. Rome numeral 3. Alongside trading goods, exchange of people, technology, religion and culture, beliefs, food crops, domesticated animals, and disease pathogens develop across far flung networks of communication exchange. Basically, we're going to spread tons of stuff across this, these uh, networks of trade and communication. Lots of different things are spreading. Technology is spreading. Culture we already mentioned, religion and all that kind of good stuff. Economics is the most basic one. Um, political ideas will also transform. Uh, so let's look at the, some different examples here that AP would like you to know about. 3.2.3.a, the spread of crops, including rice and cotton from South Asia to the Middle East, are uh, going to be... Um, you know, encouraging changes in farming and irrigation. Because once again, we start having more and more people. We need to feed them with more and more food. Water sometimes is hard to get to, especially in the desert regions. So we got to come up with some better ways. The great example that AP will expect you to know is the Kanat system. Kanat system. Here's a visual for you on the bottom right. Basically, originating in Persia, this is a gentle sloping underground channel that is going to be transferring water from some kind of aquifer under some kind of hill right so dig some wells there some vertical access shafts to let air and stuff in gravity does the rest of the work you have it come out of a, an outlet and then you can channel that water out of the outlet into irrigation that irrigation can bring water to deserty areas okay so it's a more reliable source of water you don't have to worry about rain you have to worry about the aquifer having you know enough height and uh, production there to make it flow so that's going to be really good for the, the Middle Eastern regions, the hot regions. That's the reason why it's originating in the Persian Empire. Um, the great value here is quality, volume, regularity of water flow. You no longer have to worry about um, you know, flooding and all that kind of good stuff. You can just direct this stuff uh, that way. 
Um, very expensive to construct, as you can probably imagine, but it has a really good long-term value. We see versions of the Kanat system with the aqueduct system that will um, that have already been covered with the Romans. So hopefully you can see some of the basic uh, similarities there. <clears throat> And then continuing on here, goes beyond irrigation and spread, it goes to disease as well. 3.2.3.B, uh, point point spread of disease pathogens diminish urban populations and contribute to the decline of some of the empires. Uh, the very large issue with disease impacting empires is multifaceted, multi-leveled. Number one, typically disease devastates the poor classes who are congested in urban centers. You put a ton of people in one room, I always use this example, if I had my entire classroom and I put 50 people in it and I gave one of them, you know, some transmittable disease, it's a whole lot easier for that one person to give it to everybody in that room because they're so tightly packed. If I took those same 50 kids and put them in the gymnasium and gave the one kid, the, uh, you know, an example of that disease, it's a lot harder for them to pass it. So congestion and the poor equals widespread and that's typically really, really bad news. Um, another one is the military. Typically the military is weakened because they're the ones trying to keep the order. So they're dealing with all these people that are sick and then they get sick and then when your military is sick and they start dying, well there goes half your fighting force that's supposed to be protecting you from internal and external issues. Three, uh, trade obviously is going to be affected here because people are sick, people don't want to move around to catch anything, they stop trading. Um, that's a big problem with the Dark Ages of course. Uh, once the Roman Empire falls, there's no trade happening. Therefore, people just shut down and nothing's moving. Um, and then, of course, without any money to bring in for taxes and stuff, that's an also a big reason why you can't fight off internal, external issues. And then finally, the countryside populations. They're typically left on their own, and that's not going to be good. If they haven't been killed off by disease, um, bandits and people that are looking to exploit them will often come in. Once again, we see that in numerous examples. The easiest for me on the top of my head, the Roman world, post-Roman world in the West, with uh, you know the, your Gothic tribes and stuff coming in. Uh, and, of course, the Chinese peasant classes in the countryside that are going to be getting uh, looted along some of the Silk Road areas. And once again, Rome and China. In Rome, as that empire is collapsing, the western portion will decline really, really intensely and lead us to the Dark Ages. And then, of course, China. We know the Han Dynasty collapses. Um, they try different reforms to kind of make this process lessened. Those things do not go over well. And, of course, their up, uh, um, you know, large uprisings, peasants' revolt, um, that's known as the Mandate of Heaven, right? Uh, you got to get rid of the old class because they have lost favor of the gods. Mandate of Heaven in work. In both cases, populations are decreased a lot. There's a lot of internal scrambling and reorganization that's happening in order to assert new power and such. And then finally, new religions take root in the wake. Uh, Christianity in the West, Buddhism in the East. A few slides here uh, for C. 3.2.3.C, uh, religious and cultural traditions are transformed. Um, great examples here, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, Western, Middle, Eastern. So Christianity goes from being a very clandestine, cultish type of religion, very small, very persecuted, to the official religion of the Roman Empire, thanks to Constantine and others, that further will gain power and spread to Europe and Eurasia and eventually beyond. So much so that eventually, once it kind of gets going, um, it's gonna be one of the largest religion in the world, uh, as far as the most important, if nothing else. Um, and it's very open to the peasant classes because of different doctrines, right? We can all ascend to heaven if we believe in God and do good things, correct? So um, that's really, really good for the peasant classes. There's no membership fees or anything like that. They don't have to be rich to buy their way in or anything like that, like some other um, you know, uh, polytheistic religions might have had. Hinduism in the center there of uh, Southwest Asia and South Asia, you're looking at um, Hinduism spreading and really important because we see the elevation of certain gods. Um, that's going to be the most basic uh, change here happening with Hinduism. But behind the scenes, there's a really important unification of language across different regions. And then that kind of transforms the different arts, music and poetry. That transformation will increase and spread. Um, so much so that Hinduism becomes the go-to religion in this region and pushes out Buddhism for good. Buddhism um, is pushed to the east. 
Now, in the East, it's very good, once again, for the poor and disenfranchised to look at your social pyramid of who's going to be accepting that. Um, very open-ended, once again, as long as you understand how it works and you can and, you know, live a good life, that can help you maintain nirvana. And that's what Buddhism uh, is having at its basic core. And so the peasant classes of China will embrace that with open arms. In actuality, they embrace it much quicker than the West did Christianity. Um, so that's going to be a, a really good uh, difference here when we talk about spreads of religions. And then, of course, the upper class can't be left behind as the lower classes are becoming more and more Buddhist. So they will merge certain Buddhist principles in with their own existing traditions, the most important of which is education. Um, the uh, upper class will use Buddhism as the cornerstone of education so that in the future, Everything you want to do in the in the government or higher level of social pyramid um, movement has to depend upon your knowledge of Buddhist principles. And that's going to be the case all the way up until the 20th century with the Cultural Revolution. So continuity over time, that's a very, very major one here for Buddhism. All right, and then last slide. In summary, um, from the Roman peace of uh, the Pax Romana all the way to the Sassanid Empire and Chinese dynasties, all of these large empires of this period scatter um, once they kind of go by the wayside. But as they're building, they're taking other scattered people and unifying them politically speaking. With that, they're going to do basic infrastructure things like establishing roads and other trading infrastructure elements, and then they're going to protect those routes by killing pirates and bandits and making these things successful. That trade, because they're doing that, is becoming very, very lucrative economically, but also culturally. And then culture gains different methods to spread from one society to another. You can take religion going from India to you know China, or from the Arabian Peninsula all the way through Africa, or from you know Western Europe to all of Europe and beyond. Um, you know You can use other things as well. Not all regions have the same success. Uh, we didn't talk about the Americas because, once again, they're really fractured and on their own. They're isolated. Um, and even the empires or whatever of this time period in the Americas are also isolated. Um, and they really only have the one domesticated animal, the llama. And the llama is not nearly as effective at moving goods around as their, uh, you know, oxen, horse, camel counterparts in the east. So uh, thanks for nothing there. And then finally, um, as we see more and more movement in this course, you will see way more interconnection happening as time moves forward. Trade in this time period will give way to stuff like imperialism and then movement of exploration and then dominance by the West and then moving on from there and there. Okay, So really try to focus on these next couple of days here as you get through trade and stuff of looking at how can you connect economics and trade to all the other themes of spice. If you can successfully do that, now you have all the empires under control and you have different themes of economics and stuff under control, you will have a really good picture of this time period and then you'll be able to form the foundation for the next time period. Thank you.